the University of Pennsylvania just named us the most influential think tank in the world. Um, that, uh, that probably puts you in some pretty rarefied air. <laughs> Why do you think the Heritage Foundation Board chose you? Because I'm just that good. Welcome to To the Contrary. This week I'm here at the conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation, and I'm continuing our series with women thought leaders, here with President Kay Coles-James, who's been a regular panelist on our show for many years. Welcome, Kay, and big time congratulations. <laughs> well, this, thank you. Does this make you the one of the most powerful women in politics running this well, major foundation? Yeah, I'm told that that might in fact be the case. Um, I think that when you lead uh, the nation's uh, most important conservative public policy think tank and the University of Pennsylvania just named us the most influential think tank in the world, um, that, uh, that probably puts you in some pretty rarefied air. <laughs> Now, why, did, why do you think the Heritage Foundation Board chose you? Because I'm just that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it, I, it wasn't, I mean, uh, of course that's, that's the main reason, but there, was there an effort on their part, you think, to reach out to women and people of color? You know, if you know anything about the board of the Heritage Foundation, that's just not in their DNA. Uh, truly, they were looking for someone with expertise in public policy, for someone who knew how to run and to manage things, for someone who appreciated the heritage culture. And it was sort of like Cinderella because uh, I was actually leading the search for that person. And uh, <laughs> trying so, and you on, found yourself. <laughs> right, I was trying on the glass slipper, and finally someone turned and said, Oh, Kay, would you mind trying on the glass slipper? And it fit. And you, you, know, and, you and uh, former VP Cheney. Yeah, I did a full Dick Cheney. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's important, though, Bonnie, we want to recognize the significance and the importance for minorities and for women. But also, I think it's important for us as women to recognize that we can get these things based on our merit and on our talent. And truly, truly, with this organization, it was an afterthought. And uh, I can remember uh, having dinner with some, and, and you know, and after the selection was made, and they went, "Oh my word, she's a woman, and she's and she's black." <laughs> and I said, "Thank you for noticing." <laughs> <laughs> now tell me, uh, tell f for our viewers, mm -hmm. uh, your the Heritage Foundation. I think from people who don't really understand Washington sure. politics might be thought of as. In, totally in tune with the Republican Party's <laughs> philosophy, but sure. you're not. Well, no, we're not. Um, and, uh, you know, there are times when I think the uh, Republican Party and even the administration wishes we were, but uh, we're a conservative public policy think tank. And so there are uh, values and principles that uh, we promote. And when we see those on uh, within the Democrat Party, we want to applaud and encourage those. I look for the opportunity to work across party lines. Uh, we hold Republicans accountable when they are not uh, in tune with the values and the ideals that we promote. And so sometimes that means taking on our own president. Um, and when that happens, we, we actually do that. How do you feel about this president? I mean, he, um, you know, went on the record as saying he sexually assaults women in very ugly ways. He um, he has been widely reported to have cheated on her, his wife when she mm -hmm. was quite pregnant. Um, are those values that conservatives embrace? Absolutely not, and that should not come as a surprise. But I learned a valuable lesson from my progressive and liberal women friends. And that is when the president is giving them the things that they want, they surround it and they protected those presidents. So I think it's important to speak out against boorish behavior and bad behavior when it exists, 
but don't look at me with any kind of hypocrisy at all because I watched over the years as uh, they protected their guys when they were getting the stuff they wanted. Are you talking about Hillary Clinton? I'm talking about, well, you know, it goes all the way back. You can look at, you can look at Bill Clinton. You can look at Lyndon Johnson, for crying out loud. Well, that you was a different era. I mean, mm. you know, and, and Kennedy, too. Dan but Kennedy, back all of then, them. you know, they, back then it, it wasn't reported that Kennedy had physical problems. FDR was hardly ever shown in his wheelchair. You know, those were different. Yeah, this and was we, we, way we, pre-internet. We, we hid a lot of that behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if African Americans actually heard Lyndon Johnson using the N-word, they probably would have supported him anyway because of the important work that he did in civil rights. My only point is that many of these are flawed individuals, uh, flawed men, and uh, I think that uh, learning a lesson, as I said, from my progressive women friends. Which ones? They get all of them. <laughs> <laughs> they got what they wanted from Bill Clinton, so they surrounded and they protected him. We see that coming out of Hollywood. We, when, when, you know, just recently that stuff became uh, public, but it was a public secret. Everyone knew that that kind of behavior existed out there. But they were getting what they wanted. They were getting the roles in the films they wanted. They were getting the advancement. So they put up with it. So quite frankly, you know, I, I, I don't have a whole lot of patience for that. Uh, we as women cut deals and get what we want. Ronald Reagan produced 49% in his four years in office of a conservative agenda that we produce called the Mandate for Leadership. Uh, Trump has done 64% in year one. He's producing. Is that does that make you happy or sad? Is that plenty well, he's or producing. not enough? <laughs> well, no, I'm very pleased with the quality and the kinds of changes that we're getting in some really important areas. And um, so, what what where is he agreeing with you? Well, we're getting a lot of things uh, in terms of uh, his push on infrastructure. We're about to get some entitlement reform. He's done a phenomenal job on tax relief. We're excited about that. So uh, we're seeing deregulation take place where we have been an overregulated country. So we're seeing a lot of positive things in terms of policy. Now, let's talk about entitlements. And judges. Don't forget judges. Um, yes. Let's talk uh, entitlements. All right. You are clearly a warmer, fuzzier conservative <laughs> than your average. You know, you're much more likable. I hate to say this, but it's true than than some of the congressional leadership, let's say. Um, but do you agree with them about cutting federal programs that support poor people? Well, Bonnie, that is a loaded question, and it's framed in a very loaded way. I am in favor of programs that empower people, that lift them up, that give them hope and opportunity. I am not in favor of programs that have sapped uh, people's uh, spirit, diminish their hope. Uh, Which and, programs? Well, uh, there are food stamps, well, welfare. All of those programs are intended to encourage and to help. We have seen an explosion in food stamp programs. Republicans are not mean spirited people. If someone is hungry, I want to feed them. If someone needs housing, I want to make sure they're housed. If someone needs access to health care, I want to make sure they get it. But you have to know, if you study those programs carefully and closely, that there are individuals who are taking advantage of those programs who probably are usurping those things from folks who truly need them. Um, it was not intended to be generational or as a lifestyle. It was tended to be but, a helping hand. But yes, but welfare reform under President Clinton some almost 20 years ago, got rid of a lot of that. I mean, women who go on welfare have to work. They don't have a choice. If they stop working, they, they lose their welfare payments. Well, you and food may not stamps, know. Food stamps, no, no, let me, let mm -hmm. me, food stamps does not suffer from the kind of corruption that, say, Medicare, Medicaid payments did with doctors uh, over the last few years. Nobody's reported on that if it has. But 
So, I mean, if you take people off, you're going to be taking poor people. You're going to be cutting poor people who say they have not enough to eat off federal rolls. That doesn't seem mean to you? Of course that would be mean, but that's not what's happening. And uh, you may remember uh, that I was the Secretary of Health in Virginia and did welfare reform there the year before Bill Clinton did it nationally. And it was fascinating to me to see how this worked out uh, in the area of politics. Because we did welfare in Virginia that was far less restrictive than what happened at the national level. And yet, I was harming poor people, and Bill Clinton was the first black president. <laughs> so, so I was able to. So you I, think the media are too mean to you? Uh, to, uh, not, no, I mean, what, does it matter anyway? No, really? I'm just asking, is, is it because of the way you were portrayed versus the way Bill Clinton was portrayed no, in the media? I think it's just political. I don't take it as mean or not mean. Or, you know, it's just, it's pure politics pure and simple because when we did it in Virginia it was mean when Bill Clinton did it nationally it wasn't and it was just you know really striking to me to see the difference and that's when I began to really understand this is not truly about empowering or helping poor people it's political it's pure politics um, again, so when you say when you say pure politics do you mean the Democrats were coming after you? Uh, I'm just, when you say pure politics, how was it? It's pure politics. It's when a Republican does it bad, when a Democrat does it good. And so, you know, no one was actually sitting down and studying it. I encourage people to take the two pieces of legislation, put them side by side, and actually analyze Virginia's, them. Virginia's, yeah, Virginia's welfare well, reform. at that time and, and what happened nationally. What so, percentage of people on food stamps do you think are, are shysters? Oh, I have no idea how much fraud is involved in that. There are, there are people who have uh, suggestions and ideas and who know that. Uh, we know that it has grown exponentially uh, over the last few years in terms of the people who are enrolled. Uh, and when I talk to people who are in the community and who desperately need those resources, uh, they want to make sure that they are protected for the folks who really need it and not those who, who actually don't. I don't know any American that doesn't want a poor kid or a hungry kid fed. So let's, let's take that off the table. I mean, that's just so much rhetoric. Um, and I also know that there are individuals who truly believe that there are folks who are on those programs that are robbing and sapping those programs of resources and keeping them away from truly needy people. So let's sort that out. Um, we also know that when how, how do you, Tell me, how, how do you sort that out? Well, you know, you it's investigate. interesting when there are work requirements, uh, it, it, how many people rotate off right at that time. Uh, so we've got to build incentives into the programs to make people become self-sufficient and independent. We don't want to build programs that make people dependent for life. Um, I, I came out of a family who, who you know, who benefited from that safety net. So I want that safety net there, and I want it there for the truly needy, but I don't want to see generation after generation of people who uh, don't take advantage of or don't know how to take advantage of the opportunities that this country has. Let's transfer to our, our discussion over to the healthcare arena. Mm -hmm. Do you want to see Obamacare completely done, whatever's left of it at this point, <laughs> completely done away with. I want to see free market principles at work. I want to see patients have choices. I want to see the health care dollars spent to the best uh, to get the kind of health care that people deserve. I don't think that what we saw with the individual mandate, I don't think that what we saw with uh, uh, how the exchanges uh, developed an opportunity for free markets to reign and for people to have choice. So do I want to see those things fixed? I do. So what do you say to young, poor women, many of whom are of color, 
who want access to birth control pills and won't get them under uh, anything but Obamacare. Well, first of all, I just don't think that's factually accurate, and I have no opposition to anyone who wants uh, 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 reproductive care in terms of uh, contraception, uh, having the ability to get that. It's not my issue. Okay, but, but when you say having the ability to get that, there are young women who plain out, cannot afford it unless it's covered by their health insurance. What do you say to them? Too bad? No, I think what you say is there are options, um, and there should be options. Uh, quite frankly, at my age, I'm more interested in estrogen replacement <laughs> therapy than I am in birth control. So why should I have to have birth control in my health plan? So I think that we ought to have a multiple variety of health plans, and people choose what's best for them. So there would be uh, more ERT for women in one end of the spectrum and more options to cover birth control for young women at the other end of the spectrum. I think that, spectrum. I, you know, I think that when you have options, people can make choices about what's best for them. But to mandate a certain level of coverage for everyone and we all have to pay for that, I, I, it's just not something I want or need for my health care. But do I want to deny it for someone else? Or do I want that option to go away or disappear? Absolutely not. Let's have choice. Let's uh, have freedom. Okay, and I know, you know, conservatives are big believers in the free market, but progressives, the response to that is, if you don't mandate it, the, the, the insurance companies aren't going to provide it. They're just not. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting what happens when free markets do reign. If, if there is a need, and a dollar to be made, someone is going to provide that service. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the environment. Well, we're going to go down all the issues. <laughs> all, the, all the issues you hate to talk about. <laughs> yes, we're going just, okay. just a little bit. Okay. Um, do you think the president's deregulations are, are good for the economy, bad for the economy, good for the environment? Bad well, I think that we, you know, there's, there's a dirty little secret in this town, and that is um, that, and those of us who've worked here long enough uh, discovered it a while ago, what you can't get through law, you can get through regulation. So they will pass very broad laws, and people are happy, and everyone goes home, and they turn them over to the departments, and then they develop regulations. And so what's happened over the years is the regulatory environment originally was for health and safety. And it has broadened. And, and so what you see is a lot of prescriptive uh, uh, things happening through the regulatory process. So this president has said, uh, you know, we're going to uh, go back to health and safety and anything else that, it, that, uh, that costs volumes of money, slows down processes, is overly prescriptive for small and large businesses we need to take a second look at. I don't know where this came from that Republicans love drinking dirty water, breathing nasty air, and fishing in streams that are clogged. I mean, we love our environment and our country as much as anyone else. Uh, I want clean air for my grandkids. I want clean drinking water in uh, our urban areas. So those things are important to us as well. But I think that there is room at the table for discussion about how best to deliver those things. And what do you think the best way is to, to just to let the market again prevail? Well, I think that when you look at uh, some of the specifics uh, in those areas, there's lots of room for us to, uh, to maintain clean water, clean air, clean streams, clean rivers, uh, without being overly prescriptive. And that's what I think the president and uh, our EPA director are looking at. Um, we're right in the middle, obviously, of a major political battle over gun rights in this country. Mm -hmm. Does Heritage take a position on the Second Amendment? Of course we do. Okay. 
And how do you... <laughs> we do you it should come as no surprise. We support the Second Amendment. Of course. To what extent? Uh, to the fullest extent. Um, to an unlimited extent? Well, you know, I think that everyone recognizes that you can support the Second Amendment and be agreeable to, um, you know, to looking at how best to enforce that or enact that or allow that. Um, and so our policy thinkers are looking at that within Heritage and you'll see some work coming out in the very near future because uh, with the environment that we're in right now, I think there needs to be some leadership on these issues. I am more concerned about school safety than I am about banning guns, quite frankly. Uh, I have grandchildren who go to these schools and, and nieces and nephews who are on these college campuses. And I want How do them they safe. feel? How do they feel about gun regulation? Well, I think all of us want those safe. But if you want them safe, and you're not just about promoting an anti-gun agenda and using the crisis to do that, then you recognize that the problem is far broader than that. And I mean, and, and we all know that. If you look at these issues, you know that we're talking about mental health. We know that we're talking about violence in Hollywood and gaming industry. We know that uh, we've got to look at how is it that I get on an airplane and I'm safer than when my grandkid goes into a high school. So the reality is, you know, let's do something real and not just use this crisis in America as an opportunity to go after uh, the Second Amendment. Did you watch the kids speak out after Parkland? I did. And what did you think of those I kids? I was so encouraged. I love those kids. I love those kids. And Our yet, democracy doesn't work unless people are informed and engaged. Uh, they were engaged, and now I'd like them to get informed. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think they were informed? Uh, on some points, no, they weren't. And Such I, as? Well, you know, such as focusing almost exclusively on guns and not looking at the broader issue of what causes violence. Uh, we're a, you know, a violent culture, and we've got to address that. Do you, you want to take, do, is you, do you think Hollywood and the media should be regulated? Uh, I think they should regulate themselves a whole lot better than they do. I think they should take some ownership and responsibility for the stuff that they produce. Um, I, you know, I don't think you can, you can uh, regulate people's behavior. Uh, we just had a conversation about the regulatory environment. I'm certainly not going to now sit here and say, uh, yes, we should have a whole new round of regulations. Uh, but I'm hoping that people will do the right thing, that people will step forward and say we have a social responsibility in these areas. You know, there's, there's, there's even, I think, room to talk about family and family structure. How many of these angry young black, uh, not black, they were almost, oh, they were all exclusively white. How many of those young men who were school shooters uh, had no fathers in the home? And the young black men in urban areas who, who are living and dying on the streets uh, have fathers there to help and to guide them. And quite frankly, Bonnie, I, I have a problem with um, the fact that you can pick an urban area and kids are dying on street corners every weekend and there is no call, you know, to, to do something about that. And we have a school shooting uh, and then all of a sudden the country is up in arms. I think those kids who die on the street corners in urban areas, lives are just as important and just as valuable. And so I think the question is way broader than just guns. And I think if we focus on just guns, we will miss a tremendous opportunity to talk about how to turn this country around. But you know, you talk about Holly, shaming Hollywood into doing something about the levels of violence, which I totally agree are toxic um, and probably do affect kids at, at young ages. Um, isn't that kind of like shouting down a wind tunnel? I mean, are you? I would hope not. I would hope not. And I think there are people of conscience who are there in that environment who will step up, who will speak up. And I think that uh, if we don't hold them accountable, 
if we don't engage in those conversations, it's never going to change. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kay. <laughs> um, and you know we love you at To the Contrary. It's because so I'm to the contrary. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. That's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbds.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. Thank you.